The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. We're just hours away from Hurricane Sandy. No live stream today because we actually are taping the show a little bit early because uh, we need to account for that possibility, Lewis, that the roads could get very, very bad. And we need to be hunkered down with our bathtubs full of water and cans of soup that I would have no way of heating up if the power goes out because my stove is electric. Thank you. Yes. What else can I add to that? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe not much. You know what's funny? I, right, you know what a lot of uh, uh, religious right people can add to this discussion? That uh, this is happening because of the gays? <laughs> of course. Of course. Chaplain John McTernan has said God's judgment of gays caused the hurricane that is nearing the east coast of the United States. On it, he has this website called Defend Proclaim the Faith. He says that the gathering storm must be God's judgment on gays and punishing the president, Barack Obama, for coming out in support of marriage equality. It's interesting because a lot of the people being affected by the hurricane are anti-gay, right? I mean, there's anti-gay people all over the place. It's, it's, I always wonder at this logic. Yeah, uh, it's, it's not logic. Oh, okay. I don't, yeah, I don't <laughs> want to... I don't know what I can say on the air here, but uh, I'm just going to leave it at that. McTernan has also said in the past, Obama is 100% behind the Muslim Brotherhood, which has vowed to destroy Israel and take Jerusalem. He also blamed Hurricane Isaac, which later became a tropical storm, on homosexuals. He said, gay festival southern decadence was to blame, as God was putting an end to the city and its wickedness. God has so much time on his hands. Because God is omnipotent, not only can he pay attention to the creation of the planets and uh, uh, the development of humans and designing every species that exists, but he can also pay attention to specific uh, festivals that take place, whether they be music or civil rights, and actually send weather events specifically to those cities and towns. It's incredible because he is omnipotent. Right. Um, I guess it's just, this is just like one big experiment, right? God's just like an angry little child who just likes to like destroy stuff we're like a little anthill and he's he's got the magnifying glass right and he's just he doesn't like gay people so he's gonna send a hurricane yeah very logical very adult mm -hmm. top mitt romney surrogate john sununu suggested that the colin powell endorsement of president obama which we talked about last week might have been motivated by race because obviously if any black person votes for a black president it's because of the black, right? Because of the blackness. Why else would it be? There's no alternative. Here's the video of that. Colin Powell has uh, decided to opt for President Obama again, despite apparently still being a Republican. Is it time he left the party, do you think? Well, I'm not sure uh, how important that is. Right. I do like the fact that Colin Powell's boss, George Herbert Walker Bush, has endorsed Mitt Romney all along. Okay. And frankly, uh, when, when you take a look at Colin Powell, you have to wonder whether that's an endorsement based on issues or whether he's got a slightly different reason for preferring hmm. uh, President Obama. What reason would that be? Well, I think uh, when you have somebody of your own race that you're proud of being president of the United States, I applaud Colin for standing with him. Yeah, I mean, it's like when white people were proud after Bill Clinton's first term of the job he did, they'd say, well, I I'm proud. I'm white, he's white, and I'm proud of him. So I'll vote for him because we are both white. That makes perfect sense. But of course, this never is discussed when it is not minorities. What a double standard, Natan. Yeah, absolutely. And I was recently reading an article, uh, I forget the name of the political scientist, he did an analysis of Google search words and its effect, its connection with uh, people not voting for Obama in 2008 only because he was black and different correlations. And overall, the amount of people in the U.S. that wouldn't vote for a black candidate outweighs the people who would only vote for him because he's black. Right. There's plenty more people that are going to vote for the other guy because Obama's black than the number of people like Colin Powell who, because the president is black, are going to vote for him. But you're not you're not saying because Colin Powell, because they're both no. black. That's no, I'm right. saying yeah. if you believe this line right. of thought. I mean, the other thing, if, if we do believe John Sununu, we have to assume that there are also people, uh, uh, exactly what Natan is saying, that their theory indicates if people are voting for Obama because he is black, there have to be people not voting for him because he is black. No doubt. And again, never mentioned when it is white candidates. Lawrence Wilk Wilkerson, who's a Republican and a former Colin Powell aide, blasted John Sununu saying, my own Republican Party is full of racists. This is great video of Lawrence Wilkerson on the Ed Schultz show on MSNBC. Listen to what he had to say about his own party. 
in the comment that John Sununu made, he said, when you look at Colin Powell, there may be some other reasons why he would support President Obama. What, what does this say, if anything, about the Republican Party? Does, it, it, isn't this getting to be somewhat of a brand of the Republican Party? Well, on Governor Sununu's part, I think it was an unfortunate slip of words. But you're insinuating something, and you're insinuating something that is absolutely accurate. My party, unfortunately, is the bastion of those people, not all of them, but most of them, <laughs> who are still basing their decisions on race. Let me just be candid. My party is full of racists. And the real reason a considerable portion of my party wants President Obama out of the White House has nothing to do with the content of his character, nothing to do with his competence as commander-in-chief and president, and everything to do with the color of his skin. And brilliant. I mean, brilliant what he's saying here. What he, what he really is saying is that not all Republicans are racists, but by and large, the majority of racists are Republican. And we've heard this for so long, and it's offensive to say it, and the right wing gets all the, you know, their panties in a bunch when, when, it, when it's said, but it's the reality. It's just the reality. Yeah, we talk about this all the time, uh, but we can because we're not Republicans. President Obama himself dismissed John Sununu's suggestion, by the way. He told Michael Smirkanish any suggestion that General Powell would make such a profound statement in such an important election based on anything other than what he thought was best for the country doesn't make much sense. And we have no reason to think that Colin Powell, well, except for the fact that he decided to make those statements, making the case that there were those weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, that wasn't best for the country. But he did come out and say, you know, that was a mistake. But uh, he, he, I don't know. I, that, I, every time I think about Colin Powell, I do think he's a stand-up guy in terms of who he endorses, who he thinks he believes. But he did admit to having made that mistake back then, you know? Yeah, and this, is, this might get me in some hot water, but we uh -oh. don't really know uh, whether or not going into Iraq was the worst-case scenario for this country. I mean, perhaps things we secured over there in terms of uh, oil because of our dependence on it right. may have actually in the long term helped this country significantly. Yes, hypothetically. Of course, yeah. it didn't turn out that way. All that cheap oil we were getting it from Iraq never actually happened. And then we're actually in worse shape right now uh, in terms of energy so, and the so outlook. Is, maybe is, he did have the country's best interest at heart. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Not that in ac it actually worked out that way, but maybe at the time Colin Powell did think what he was doing was the best thing long term maybe, for the maybe, country. Maybe. maybe. We don't know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Lawrence Wilkerson here, very, very brave to come out and say, most of the racists are in my party and this is a problem. There's a new Mitt Romney ad which is pushing the false claim that Chrysler Jeep is sending jobs to China. Mitt Romney actually told the story at, campaign, at a campaign event in Defiance, Ohio last week. Basically went out there and he said, I saw a story today that, uh, what, what exactly did he say? That one of the great manufacturers in this state, Jeep, now owned by the Ita Italians, is thinking of moving all production to China. Romney was apparently uh, responding to reports on right-wing blogs that misinterpreted a Bloomberg news story. So what's the actual story and what's the story Mitt Romney is talking about? Let's be very clear here. Chrysler owns Jeep, okay? They said, Jeep has no intention of shifting production of Jeep models outside of North America to China. It's simply reviewing opportunities to return Jeep output to China for the world's largest auto market. Real story? They're looking at selling Jeeps to China to make money. Romney's story, they're looking at outsourcing the production of Jeeps, of Jeeps to China. See the difference, Lewis? I know it's nuanced. One is the exact opposite of the other, but I could see why people would be confused. There is a difference. So uh, then yeah. we got this ad from Mitt Romney. This is the ad that came out. Who will do more for the auto industry? Not Barack Obama. Fact checkers confirm his attacks on Mitt Romney are false. The truth? Mitt Romney has a plan to help the auto industry. He's supported by Lee Iacocca and the Detroit News. Oh, good. Obama took GM and Chrysler into bankruptcy and sold Chrysler to Italians who are going to build Jeeps in China. All right. Mitt so then, I mean, you know, let's be honest. If Lee Iacocca is supporting Mitt Romney, that's going to, we need a fundamental paradigm shift uh, uh, about how we think of this election. I had no idea Lee Iacocca was supporting Mitt Romney. Is there any, are there any repercussions for ads that are completely false uh yes that are straight N natan, out lies. natan these work right uh well let me tell you what doesn't work uh the the mainstream media calling these out 
uh, they're pretty much the only actor in this whole ball game that could actually, st- you know, put their foot down and actually uh, come out against it and maybe help people make an informed decision, but they're not doing that. One final it, fact this, check. This ad, there could be people out there who the only ad they ever see is, is this that one. one. And they say, what? There should, be, there should be legal repercussions to lying in campaign ads. And it's funny because Chrysler Jeep is actually bringing more Jeep production to Ohio. They're going to add about 2,000 jobs there. So it's, it's really sad that this, these, these lies are what people are, are hearing. But it's, it's the reality. Mm-hmm. Republican Congressman Roscoe Bartlett is now blasting working moms. Hey, what, what the hell? We've already been criticizing women for years. Let's just say working moms specifically should now be in our crosshairs. This is incredible. He said, um, uh, the Washington Post has the quote, and Roscoe Bartlett said the following, this isn't the politically correct thing to say, but when we drove the mother out of the home into the workplace and replaced her with the television set that was not a good thing. What does this even mean? I can tell that it's in a way comparing women to television sets. In other words, women were replaced by television sets and women working was a bad thing. I know that somewhere in there he's trying to make a positive comment, but this is, what is this guy talking about? By the way, just for reference, this is the guy who compared student loans to the Holocaust. We covered that a month or two ago. And he also said that the information age is just a high-tech bubble. You can't eat electrons and they won't keep rain off of your head. They won't take you anywhere. So the information age is just not something that's good. Um, this guy does not really know how to put together uh, an idea in a way that sounds even remotely coherent or, or positive. Or a sentence. I think he's trying to say something about how children are raised now and their exposure to the TV. media and all of these other uh, evils, as he probably considers them. Right. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's odd. The other funny thing is he talks about we drove women out. Again, it's this idea that women are subservient and we, I don't know if we as men or we as politicians or who the we is, but a collective we decided We've got it. We're going to change what women do. We're going to push them out of the home right. and we're going to make them work. Right. I so, mean, isn't that the underlying thing here, Natan? Yeah. I mean, I think this guy Roscoe is a pretty reasonable guy overall. <laughs> I think he's, he's taking a good look at all of the actual evidence and he's on the right side of history. For yeah, sure. there you go. <laughs> he sounds like a student of uh, Phyllis Shapley. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wow, so there he is, Roscoe Bartlett. And actually, if you haven't seen our Republican rape compilation on, uh, on YouTube, Roscoe Bartlett makes an appearance where he says, how often is it that someone actually, um, uh, that the, I, you know what, I forget the quote, but he's in this compilation video of Ron Paul's honest rape and Todd Akin's legitimate rape and uh, 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 Murdoch's God-given rape. Uh, Roscoe Bartlett makes a cameo appearance there, so check that out. Okay. Monday, before we take a break, book recommendation. Lewis, these book recommendations are getting very, very popular, I must say. Good. Congratulations. Thank you. These are, of course, brought to you in part by A Fashion of Bastards, the best-selling satirical forecast of American politics circa 2015, praised as utterly hilarious, foreboding, and entertaining all at once. It's written by Joanna Louise Johnson. Find it on Amazon.com. I've just finished the second of two books in a series by Connie Willis. The first is Blackout. The second is All Clear. You know, I started the the first one, Blackout, based on a a friend's recommendation. It's kind of a World War II book, but it's also kind of a futurist time travel sci-fi book, but most of it does occur in World War II. It's two books. If you read the first one, Blackout, you're going to want to read the second one, All Clear. Fantastic. Number one, the level of research and detail about what it was like to be in World War II England is fantastic, and it really will give you a a great sense of the day-to-day life there. If you're not a World War II history buff, as I was not going in, give the book a shot because it really will give you a great, uh, a, a really good flavor of what that was like. Also, if you have any interest at all in time travel, if you enjoyed the movie Back to the Future when you were younger, if you liked the movie, that the, the book time, The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, or if you've never really re- read anything about time travel, check it out also because it fantastically addresses the paradoxes of time travel. In other words, if I travel back to 1946 and come back to present day and then travel back to 1944 and spend two years and actually am there, on that date in 1946 that I had previously traveled back to, what happens? 
What happens? How does, what happens with that paradox if time travel were to be a possibility? Highly recommend it. Blackout and All Clear by Connie Willis. All of my book recommendations now online at davidpackman.com slash book. So if you want to go back and check out the list, davidpackman.com slash book. So let's take a break. Plenty more coming up on today's show. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at davidpackman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. You can support The David Pakman Show free anytime you do any shopping on Amazon.com. Before going to Amazon, go to our website, davidpakman.com. On the right side of the website, there's a black <laughs> banner that links to Amazon. Click it, bookmark that link, use it anytime you shop. And what will happen is from your purchase, about 7% will be taken away from Amazon and given to The David Pakman Show. What's Redistribution, Lewis. What do you think of that? I like it. Pretty shocking. It's like Robin Hood stuff. Shocking stuff. Yeah. And of course, our membership program, made possible in part by liberalbias.com. Sometimes reality just doesn't live up to right wing ideals. There's only one explanation. Reality obviously suffers from liberal bias. Find out more at liberalbias.com. Today's new member of the day, I want to say hello to Miss Sang. And I'm not sure whether she pronounces her first name Bridget or Brigitte. I think that it's not necessarily indicated by the spelling. I think that it's sometimes personal preference. In other words, sometimes people say, my last name is Levine. And some people some say it's, it's Levine, but it could be spelled the exact same way. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Or some people could say, well, my name is Megan, or it's Megan, or it's Megan. And there's a number of spellings there. And or some it's Megan. Or it's Megan, exactly. So mm. Brigitte Sang or Bridget Sang, thanks so much for being a David Pakman Show member. Uh, our uh, David Pakman Show member, Forrest, sent me an image of an anti-gay marriage pledge that Mitt Romney signed, okay, with his signature. Let's put it up full screen if we can, Natan, to give people the best possible look at it. And it says, I, Mitt Romney, pledge to the American people that if elected president, I will support sending a federal constitutional amendment defining marriage as the union of one man and one woman to the states for ratification. Two nominate to the U.S. Supreme Court and federal bench judges who are committed to restraint and to applying the original meaning of, con of the Constitution and thus rejecting the idea our founding fathers inserted a right to gay marriage into our Constitution and three, defend the Defense of Marriage Act vigorously in court. Interesting. And, you know, there's a couple other things there. So this is Mitt Romney's signature. Again, we know that Mitt Romney has been caught on video saying things which he didn't mean. He's been caught recorded on audio saying things he didn't mean. So he could obviously have signed something he didn't mean. In fact, he has. There's plenty of Bain-related documents with his signature on them that he says he just wasn't involved in at all. Wouldn't be a surprise if he says, well, that pledge, yeah, I don't know about that. We're talking about stuff from when he retroactively retired from <laughs> right. Bain, right? Mitt Romney may have retroactively unsigned this thing. Mm. That, and we just would never know because we, we just have the hard copy. Yeah. Who knows? You never know with Mitt Romney. Look what he did with uh, same-sex marriage in Massachusetts. No question about know. it. So what we have to be aware of this, this is a guy. And But you know what? The, the real thing that I take from this is not about the DOMA stuff, because that's already being ruled unconstitutional, and uh, also not about um, the, the federal constitutional amendment, but about item two, the nominating of Supreme Court justices. That, as, as we talked about with Adam Winkler last week or the week before, Hugely important when we look at the next four years that we do not have someone like Mitt Romney who is going to appoint the types of judges that right here on paper he has signed saying he will appoint. Utmost importance. Absolutely important. Definitely. Thank you. Okay. Brad Brandon is a Minnesota pastor. He is linking, we earlier in the show, we had one pastor linking Hurricane Sandy, which we are bracing for now, to homosexuality. Now we have a Minnesota pastor named Brad Brandon linking homosexuality to Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany. So via A equals B, B equals C, what we really have here is that Hurricane Sandy is of course 
linked to Nazi Germany and World War II Adolf Hitler. Anything's possible. Anything's possible. Let's get a, uh, listen to some of the audio. Check out this local news story about this individual, Brad Brandon. Sounds like a hell of a guy. Marriage amendment debate has been. Some say it recently crossed a line. How many are familiar with what happened in World War II under Adolf Hitler? At rallies in Woodbury, <laughs> Bemidji, and Brainerd, Minnesota for Marriage's Director of Church Outreach, Reverend Brad Brandon, compared Hitler's actions against Jews to what he says is happening to Christians now. Right. Adolf Hitler took away two fundamental rights from a group of people in order to suppress them. Those two fundamental rights I'm going to show you tonight are the same rights that are being taken away from the Christian community. <laughs> While Brandon said no one side represents Hitler, he didn't stop the comparisons to those against the amendment. Here he is in Brainerd talking to a Jewish audience member whose family was nearly wiped out in the Holocaust. He murdered them. There was no suppression. He murdered them. The, correct. He did murder them. But in order to murder them, he suppressed their rights. Minnesotans United for All Families faith director. Yeah, all right. So this is, this, it's funny. I always, when I see something like this, remember when Pat Buchanan used to always be very, very skeptical and concerned and worried about the Jews? All of a sudden, when he started thinking that it was the Hispanic population that was going to overrun the whites, he's saying, hey, 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 we've got to defend the Irish and the Jews and blah, blah, blah. Everybody will, you know, all these guys, they'll criticize one group. And then when there's like a worse group that they're worried about, they'll say, we need to be defending the first group I criticized from the second even worse group. And what we see here uh, uh, from, from uh, uh, Brad Brandon is he also is saying, you know, these right wingers who don't really care that much about Jews, we know that. In other words, many of them think the Jews are going to hell, so on and so forth. All of a sudden, when it's gay marriage, Hey, this is like when the Jews were being profiled and attacked. We can't do that. We, we, we can't allow that to happen again. What's more similar, the treatment of anti-gay Christians by the general population <laughs> or, I mean, what's more similar to, to the Nazis or the fear tactics that this guy's using? Right. Uh, you tell me. Yeah, that's, that's the reality. I mean, in a ton, I feel like the irony of this double standard on who we need to defend each other from, the, 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 moving, the moving target that it represents is completely lost on these right wingers. Yeah, you know, I'm really happy that the memory of all Holocaust victims is being, um, you know, adequately um, contextualized. Yeah, yeah, contextualized by very astute, um, you know, analyses and analogies being made to, uh, you know, anti-Christian, anti-gay marriage Christians. Excuse me. It's, I mean, it, what yeah. is wrong with this guy? It's such an insult. I mean, for example, my my maternal grandfather's family left Poland before the war, in part because of what was to come. And the idea that the fear there was basically equally as justified based on what happened as anti-gay bigoted Christians being told you're not going to be able to impose your hateful bigotry on everybody. It's, it's, a, it's a huge insult and it, it's offensive and it's despicable. Definitely. That's it. That's it. It's, Lewis it's, is just putting a, Lewis is putting a final point on it's it. It's completely insane. Another Catholic bishop is now threatening damnation <laughs> if his congregation votes for Obama. This is Bishop David L. Ricken of the Green Bay Diocese. And he wrote an email dated October 24th, which starts, Dear Brothers and Sisters in Christ, an important moment. And what he goes on to say is, I would like to review some of the principles to keep in mind as you approach the voting booth to complete your ballot. The first is the set of non-negotiables. These are areas that are intrinsically evil. Evil. What are they? Number one, abortion. Number two, euthanasia. Number three, embryonic stem cell research. Number four, human cloning. And number five, homosexual marriage. And marriage is put, of course, in quotes because homosexual marriage is not a real thing according to a lot of these guys. He says these are intrinsically evil. A well-formed Christian conscience does not permit somebody to vote for a political program that contradicts this faith and morals. So, of course, what we see here is that the name of Mitt Romney and the name of Barack Obama aren't here. So legally, there's some kind of plausible deniability. It wasn't a formal endorsement of a candidate. We all know what this is about. It's, it's, it's really sad because so many people are told growing up, so many kids are told growing up, the church is really your frame of reference for morality. And you're taught that, in a sense, it's an indoctrination of sorts from day one. And then you don't have the right defenses when you are told this. So whether or not Mitt Romney's name is mentioned specifically, this is a relationship for, which for many people is the uh, uh, be all end all, right? No abortion, no euthanasia, no homosexual marriage. 
and it is affecting voting. That's the reality. Right. These people wield power, and they're sitting in front of their their congregation, right, full of sheeple, if you will, right, and they take everything this guy says as. Uh, as the word of God. Which quite literally he believes it to be. In other words, we're not even using that term as a metaphor. Literally, he right. says this is the word of God. Right. Very, very disturbing stuff. Please get the bonus show. We'll talk extensively about our hurricane prep tactics today and a guy who got a Romney tattoo on his face. DavidPakman.com slash membership. Lewis hosts and produces the bonus show. Support the show. Get a membership. Stay tuned back after this. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Make sure to check out our new YouTube channel, youtube.com slash TDPS interviews. We've got some great interviews up there, a bunch from, uh, from the old days, the archives, a bunch of new stuff. Some highlights, we've got the latest Paul Cameron interview where he admitted to having had an attraction to men when he was younger. Uh, of course, anti-gay Paul Cameron, as well as a recent, uh, a not-so-recent interview with Cenk Uygur from the Young Turks where we talk about the state of the media and many other things. Check that one out at youtube.com slash TDPS interviews because Cenk will be back on the show, actually, very, very soon. That's right. Very good. Yes. Excellent. Very good. Fox News. This is a great article by Lou Collagiovanni, our friend from the Examiner and the We Survive Bush, You'll Survive Obama Facebook page. Uh, Michael Scheuer is a regular guest on the Fox News channel. And he went on and he said, Democrats are good at watching Americans die. Hmm. Pretty straightforward, I guess. Let's take, uh, get a look at a little bit of that video, why don't we, Lewis? To hold a closed door hearing on what the president do and when he knew about it concerning Benghazi. But unfortunately, None of that's going to happen until after the election. Michael Shore used to call the shots at the CIA's bin Laden unit. Now he's calling out the Let Obama me stop it right there for a second. One of the things I think, before we get to the clip, that might be going on with Michael Schur or Scheuer, whatever his name is, um, is that he may be angry that he didn't get bin Laden. I think that there may be some resentment here because what he, he comes on and he says the most outrageous things. And for people who are watching on video, Watch the look on his own face after he says Democrats are good at what, sitting by and watching Americans die. He seems almost shocked that he said it. Like he doesn't even know how to respond, almost like he's recognizing how absurd what he's saying is. Take a look. Here we go. On these delaying tactics. Uh, Michael, let's say they do wait, as I suspect now is unavoidable, until after the election on getting even close to any sort of details on what happened and, and, and the sequence of events. Uh, Democrats tell me, well, what's the big deal? It's a, it's a couple of weeks. Chill. Well, the Democrats are very good at watching Americans die, uh, Neil. You know, the, the, the fact that uh, you leave aside what they knew, who they knew, how they knew it. Yeah, there you go. That's just, it just how, is that, how does that count as anything fair and balanced? You, got, you have a guy on, he's a regular guest, former CIA agent, and he comes on and he says, Democrats are good at watching Americans die. Democrats are very good at watching Americans die. Classy. He has to be bitter that Obama got Osama bin Laden, doesn't he? There's bitterness. I don't know what the bitterness is about, but there's, there's serious bitterness going on. The other thing, Natan, if Democrats are good at watching Americans die, aren't Republicans very good at sending them to war to do the dying? It seems to me like uh, Bush and Cheney laugh themselves uh, you know, to Camp David and to the bank, potentially, for uh, you know, Halliburton oil contracts after the war in Iraq. So... Uh, Thousands of American troops died, hundreds of thousands of Iraqi civilians. So I don't know who they are to start talking about the Democrats. That's the way. thing. When a comment like this is said, Lewis, I think to myself first, wow, that's incredibly offensive. And why is someone saying something like that and politicizing death? And then I go to the next level and, and I say, wait a second. If I actually want to make a political analysis of this, there is a criticism of the right to make. And I don't know if we are better served by simply pointing out how despicable Michael Scheuer's statements are, or by pointing out that there's actually an argument to be made about who is responsible for death. I, I actually don't know what is more valuable. Right. I, I don't even, I can't even figure out what, what this guy is trying to say, but we did, the Democrats did not start uh, these wars. And everyone's watching our, and we our as soldiers. And we as progressives certainly didn't support Democrats doing that or Republicans doing that. Right. 
and everyone's watching our soldiers die uh, on TV. So very bizarre comments. I don't know. Bitterness what has to be a factor here. Right. Voting machines. There's an interesting video from Jackson County, West Virginia, from October 23rd, 2008, which was a demo of voting machines. And people, we, we've got a number of different investigations going on simultaneously about the election fraud. We have voting machine fraud at a very high level. In other words, the tainting or manipulating of the machines. We have the voter deregistration that's going on. All of the different things we've been talking to Brad Friedman and Dennis Campbell on. But then we also have the machines simply not functioning properly. If they're not calibrated, when you hit the touch screen, it registers the touch somewhere else. And we actually have a demo of that here from West Virginia of exactly what that looks like. Let's take a look, Lewis. A worker got to a machine and it was out of calibration this is what would happen. I'm going to touch Barack Obama there, but notice it jumped clear down to Chuck Baldwin because the machine is out of calibration. Right. Now it sent me to a, a screen to, to vote a write-in ballot. When I hit Barack Obama, the machine's out of calibration. It did not jump up to the Republican candidate. It did not vote a straight Republican ticket. It didn't do that. It jumped down to so this is an example of how irregularities in the voting machines may not give votes to Romney, but they could simply take them away from President Obama. Now, let's say, presumably that, that was October 23rd, 2008. Presumably that machine was fixed before the election. What happens if on election day that happens? Do they have the staff on hand? Are they within 15 minutes, uh, uh, two hours, 10 hours of getting there and fixing that machine so that people can cast their votes? How many people will do will vote there uh, incorrectly without noticing their vote is going to the wrong person before they close that voting machine and, and go to others? What if all the voting machines start having that problem? Yeah. In too many questions. In all, in all fairness, this could take votes away from Romney too. It could. No, there's no question that yeah. it could. It's just that when we look at it, when you put everything together, it's Tag Romney who's got an investment in the voting machines, not uh, Michelle Obama's brother, for example. So altogether, it's just not a scenario that makes me comfortable. Right. I the thing is, I mean, perhaps you could train people who work at the polls to recalibrate the touchscreens. Maybe. I don't know. I, like I've said before, everything should be handwritten. There's a lot of questions here. Yeah. There is a South Dakota Republican ad that is supporting Kristi Noem, N-O-E-M, who's a representative from that state, which uh, is, is, uh, is, they put out this ad criticizing Kristi's opponent, Matt Verilek. And it's really funny because... The music is ominous and the style of the ad is an attack ad, but it's saying positive things about Matt Verilek. Like, for example, he has two master's degrees. Well, that's suspicious. Why does he need so much education? He studied the environment. He has been and lived to a lot of places that are not South Dakota. It's incredible. The style is as if you're t saying this guy murdered his own family. But when you listen to the content, you say, well, wait a second. Is this just nonsense, or is this really the type of stuff Republicans think is bad about a candidate? Look at this. Christy Noem, Matt Verilek, radically different backgrounds, radically different visions for South Dakota. 1997, Arizona, Matt Verilek gets a degree in environmental studies uh -oh. and starts teaching at the Biosphere 2, known as an incubator for radical environmental ideas. <laughs> Back in South Dakota, Christy Nome is named Outstanding Young Farmer of the Year yeah. by the Watertown JCs. 1999, Matt Verilek earns a master's degree at the University of Glasgow, Scotland, and is named a greenhouse gas emissions broker for NatSource, a company that profits from cap-and-trade energy taxes. 2000, Matt Verilek authors a document advocating a global cap-and-trade scheme while Christy Nome is managing the family farm in Hamlin County. Obviously, this guy's out there getting master's degrees, writing papers, being involved in businesses. He's the bad guy. We need Christy Nome, who was home managing the family farm. There's nothing wrong with managing the family farm, but arguing that that is better for being a, an elected official than what, than, than what her opponent was doing is ridiculous. Yes, you're right. The content of this ad I would I would support this guy a thousand percent. It's almost an ad for the guy. Almost. Let's see if we can it. get some ominous music. I have a couple things. Let's see if we can get this going here. Okay, that's not, that's not really working. Yeah, we, I lost my ominous music. Let me see if this is it. There it is. Ah, here we go. Lewis Motomedy took time off on the weekends to help injured and hungry children 
at a local shelter. Then he went and he played a heavy metal show at a local fair. Is this the man we want making decisions for our children? Right? I mean, it could, it could be anything. It just doesn't, it doesn't matter. The music is ominous, but we could be saying, be saying anything at all. Right. Yeah, that's the style. Uh, it usually works. Uh, probably m might backfire in this case, but yeah, I don't I would know. hope it does. Really, really strange stuff. He believes in global warming. I mean, come on. Hmm. An incubator for radical environmental <laughs> ideas. Like, for example, we shouldn't destroy the earth. Whoa, get this guy out of here. Which, by the way, would af affect that family farm that Christy Nome was running. Yeah. She might not be able to grow that uh, tobacco. All right, let's take our last break. DavidPakman.com slash membership. Become a member. DavidPakman.com slash gear. Grab a t-shirt or hoodie made from 100% recycled material. Stay tuned. Back after this. The David Pakman Show at DavidPakman.com. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to the show. Brian Fisher's latest conspiracy theory is that Barack Obama's wedding ring proves that President Obama might be a closeted Muslim. Let's not waste any more time. Let's get right to the video of Brian Fisher explaining this incredible theory to us, Lewis, because it is, like I said, quite a theory. This is focal point. Brian Fisher, of course, has been a guest on this show many times. He said famously to me that the rectal wall is only one cell thick and that he agrees with the gay porn stars about something. I don't even know what. I suspect that they are very squeamish uh, about uh, Obama's favoritism for Islam. Uh, they know that it's bad for him politically if he is <laughs> perceived to be, to be showing uh, unfair favoritism toward the Islamic faith. And if he's got a ring, and I believe he does. You know, I, I've looked at the photographic evidence. We've seen some research on this. There's a... An academic expert. So let Duke. me refer to what he's talking about there. What, what he's referring to there is that earlier this month, World Net Daily uh, resident birther Jerome Corsi put out a conspiracy theory that the president's ring is, quote, adorned with the first part of the Islamic declaration of faith, the Shahada. There is no God except Allah. And he claims to have spoken to experts, like, for example, the producer of that anti-Obama movie Dreams from My Real Father, Joel Gilbert. And he concluded that the ring means Islam is significant. That's what that's the context for Brian Fisher here. Let's continue. University that's verified that that is the, the inscription on President Obama's ring. And it's not just a wedding ring chip. He he ha there are photographs of him wearing that ring since the early 1980s. Mm. Now, it became his wedding ring. That's the ring that Michelle Obama put back on his finger when they got married. But he'd been wearing it for 10 or 11 years before they got married. And the inscription, according to this academic expert at Duke and one other uh, prestigious university, verified it. Duke? Yes, the inscription on his ring says, there is no God but Allah. Literally, it says, no God but Allah. It's a very succinct and brief. Yeah. Uh, and, and that would be, you know, it, it, the reason you haven't seen any of that in the mainstream media. I mean, the mainstream media has not even discussed that. And I think the reason they do not want to discuss that is it would kind of raise the possibility that Barack Obama may, in fact, may, in fact, uh, lose, I think is what he was getting to there. Listen, the reason the mainstream media is not talking about it is because they've lost enough credibility by giving the birth certificate nonsense so much play for years. At least that's, I would hope that's why they're not talking about it. The other thing that's funny is Obama, right? Smoking cigarettes, drinking alcohol, eating pork, loving Israel, communist, elitist, and he's a Muslim. He's, he's really a Muslim. Got it, Brian. Thanks. Brian Fisher, spot on analysis. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Paul Ryan, there's some video of Paul Ryan and his wife, uh, uh, Jana, at a campaign at the Janesville Labor Day Parade. At a, at a, uh, they, rather, they campaigned, I guess, within the parade. They walked in the parade. And this guy walks up and it's caught on video. And he starts asking questions about jobs and what about this plan? Why is this? Why well, your plan isn't good for jobs? And Paul Ryan's visibly annoyed with the guy. And eventually, he asked the guy if he wants candy. 
Yeah, Paul Ryan, that's what people who want jobs really want. They want you to give them candy. Take a look at this. No, okay. and you think the same as Bush, and that's what I don't understand. Well, we're just going to disagree on that, okay? Take it. Take care. I hope you do better. Yeah. I want to get jobs, and we just have different opinion about how to get them, okay? But, so what should I have to work for to get a job? Should I have to work the same wages as in China? <laughs> should I have to work for one dollar an hour? If that's, nice day, is that right. the competitiveness that's needed? Have, have a nice day, day, all right. Would you like some candy? No. Would you like a pack of badges schedule? I need jobs in this community. There needs to be better jobs right. in the community. What is it's 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 incredible it's video. One of the best it, things ever. This is one of the best videos I've ever seen. Do you want candy? Why would you think what would it what, what would, he wants a job? He doesn't want candy. And by the way, the candy's probably coming from China too. What this this is some interesting video footage, isn't it? Also, I like the look <laughs> on his know. wife's face who just looks disgusted with having to deal with this guy. Let's just go back a little bit. Just look at the look on uh, Jonna Ryan's face and when she starts nodding at the guy, she, she looks ill. Do we have audio on this? Yeah. Have that, nice day, is that right. the Pause it right there. That's needed? Have have nice right day. here? Well, yeah. it was a little bit before. All right, well, what are we looking at? Yeah, look, look at that. <laughs> I mean, what, this, this screenshot is very, is very telling. It's quite a, quite a situation, Lewis. What's your reaction? I'm just not. Uh, it's kind of, it's funny. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of when people do stuff like this. Oh, God. Because both, both parties do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I, I like it, I, I must admit. I like, I like this type of thing no matter what happens. And I like seeing, when it happens to a lefty or a righty, it doesn't matter. I like seeing how they react to it. And offering candy, you know, say, um, uh, please schedule an interview or something. You know what I'm saying? Say something. Don't offer the kid candy. That's a little weird. It's condescending and it's weird. It is condescending. Yes. It, it does give some insight uh, as to his character. All right. Let's get into some voicemails. Our voicemail line is open 24 hours a day. It's 219-2-DAVID-P. Here is one voicemail about the presidential debates and our coverage of them. Hey, this is Dan in Corvallis, Oregon. I've really been enjoying the podcast. I've been listening for about a month and a half or so. Um, the thing is, I know the election's coming up and the debates are what the mainstream press is covering, but it would be really cool to hear you guys talk about something else. I mean, <laughs> the debates are so pointless. and You know, while the candidates may not be the same thing, they're both pretty close. They're All right. You know, I'll, I'll, my response to this is, there have been four debates, three presidential and one vice presidential, the day after we talk about the debates. Otherwise, it just kind of becomes the context. We reference the debates when talking about other things. This happens once every four years. It'll be over in a week. I don't think our debate coverage has been excessive, Lewis, by any means. No, it's necessary. I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge topic. It needs to be covered. Before let me the just, last... Wait, hold on. Let me just make a quick point about that. Yeah. Uh, the idea that these candidates are basically the same. Oh, of course we disagree I, I completely. Think I disagree, but to have one example, I think the 30 million people that are going to have health insurance as a result of quote-unquote Obamacare would have something to say about the idea that there's no difference between the candidates. Agreed. And then here is another voicemail from the Eggman about the decriminalization of marijuana, the use of the R word, a bunch of other stuff. Let's take a listen. Hi, guys, to all of you. I really liked your um, opinion on medical marijuana and the legalizing of it. And I want to specifically talk to Guatam on his issue that he believes that legalizing it isn't necessarily going to help the legalization of recreational use. Uh, Guatam, I totally agree with you that it probably would not help the recreational use. However, we don't give a hoot about that because as long as the government is going to lie to keep it illegal, we're going to lie and say we need it medicinally. So it'll still work for us, lie versus lie. Also, I'm a liberal that makes no money and I work in a factory situation. If you think that when somebody drops the R word in a conversation, it's off-putting and it makes you turn yourself off, I work in a factory where people drop the N word like it's going out of style, okay? I had to get, first I thought God, this guy was kidding, I have to get used to working with racist people. I cannot walk away from it. They are my boss, my coworker, everybody. So it's really rough trying to be a liberal in a conservative red county. Love you guys. Shalom, everybody. Live. Okay, so there is the Eggman weighing in on that. And hey, if everybody around you is dropping the R word and the N word, maybe you can't pick and choose and say, ah, I don't really want to associate with that person. Maybe everybody just uses but those words. Eggman around. makes a good point. It might be hard to escape that situation. On today's bonus show, we will talk about our preparation for Hurricane Sandy, which is set to hit any minute, really.
We will also talk about a man getting a Romney tattoo on his face for 15 grand. Would you do it? I don't know. DavidPakman.com slash membership. Get the bonus show. Support the David Pakman show. So many other great benefits. We'll talk to you tomorrow. The David Pakman Show at DavidPakman.com. <laughs>